I'm going to talk about how things are changing in the, in the development of drugs and especially in the regulatory process. Uh, that's going to mean a lot better drugs coming out a lot faster. That's basically the idea of my talk. So, uh, first of all, uh, just because uh, we have to now start being a little bit careful about um, talking because we're in the beginning of a clinical trial, I need to just put up a legal disclaimer here. And then we can jump right into it. So, what is the major problem with developing drugs? Well, um, you know, everybody knows it's expensive to do, or at least traditionally, uh, this is what we read all the time. And I think that in previous drug development modalities, uh, like normal drug discovery, monoclonal antibodies, small molecules, uh, new chemical entities, things like that. Uh, you know, I think everybody understands that you go through a ton of drug candidates, a lot of discovery before you find anything that's worth even testing in a mouse. And this has really been the bane of the industry, but I think that with gene and cell therapy, things are really changing. Uh, now, why is that? Gene and cell therapy just has very, very different attributes of development. First of all, instead of randomly discovering things, what we're doing is we're designing drugs that we can target for specific cells in your body. And then we can hit very specific pathways in those cells. And we even have on off switches that can query the cell and make sure we're in the right place, someplace that needs treatment. So think about the difference between a traditional small molecule or monoclonal antibody or a new chemical entity that when you take it as a pill or a shot in the arm, it goes all over your body. Gene and cell therapy is just not that way. Uh, we may give you something that could go all over your body, but we can tune these viral caps capsules. Gene therapy is basically viruses where we strip out their genetic information and throw it away, and we put new genetic information in there that improves your health. That's targeted for disease, and it gets down into your DNA, and it can attack the root causes of disease. I'm not going to go into this in depth today just because I could spend an hour and a half just on gene and cell therapy, obviously. But we're converting viruses into updates for your body. So with the same power of viruses to go in there and corrupt a cell, we can now use their carrying capacities to improve a cell. We can bring genetic constructs in there that improve your health. But these viral capsules can be tuned so that they're tropic for certain types of cells. So we can put things like um, antibodies on the outside of them, uh, you know, half chain antibodies that would be tropic to certain types of cells. So they would tend to attach to certain places in your body. Then the, the genetic cargo will enter the cell and it will attack a very specific pathway in the cell. So we're not just, you know, sort of screwing around with the outside of the cell. We're not even putting chemicals inside the body to inside the cell to jam up certain things. We're literally going into the DNA and we can clip certain DNA paths or we can enhance certain DNA paths. And that's tremendous power, but it's also tremendous accuracy. And then the final step is we can put something in there called, called a specific promoter that's like a smart fuse where it only turns the medicine on if it's needed. So, you know, what would determine that it's needed? Well, we can check and see if there's albumin in there and that would tell us that it's a liver cell. So if we're trying to treat the liver, we put a liver specific promoter in there, albumin uh, promoter perhaps. What if we're looking for a particular disease? Let's say we know that KRAS is upregulated in breast cancer. We might look in the cell for KRAS. So if we treat a big amount of tissue, but we only want to steer the treatment to those cells that are exhibiting characteristics of the disease, we can test for enzymes or proteins in the cell. And that drug that we put in the cell will only turn on if it matches. So it's totally different developing these drugs. It's more like developing software than randomly discovering things. And, and really random discovery has been the bane of drug development. If you look at this chart here, you can see that you have, in this chart it says 5,000 to 10,000 compounds and only 250 of them will get into preclinical development. Well, I've seen charts where it's been more like 5,000 to 20,000 and that's not unusual. Uh, but in any case, it, it normally does take about 10,000 randomly generated uh, molecules in order to find one thing that's worth taking into mice. 
but 250 is generous. And you can see that in terms of getting into clinical trials, those 250 boil down to five that get into a phase one. And then look at the bottom of the chart there, the number of years involved in this. So let's take the most optimistic one, three years in discovery and six years in clinical trials and 0.5 years uh, in FDA review. So it's a long and it's a very risky road because there's so much fallout you could start off with something that looks really promising in a phase one, it dies in a phase two and you have nothing. So the uh, gene and cell therapy is turning out to be much shorter and to just give you our personal experience, uh, what we're seeing right now is from idea to first human efficacy takes us two years and, uh, and about uh, $10 million to cross that whole uh, chasm. Now that's ridiculously short. Think about this, like minimum three years in here, but it's really more co common that it's six years. And usually we have a go, no go decision in the 100,000 to $200,000 range where we know the probability of this working in the clinic actually being able to get in to a phase one human trial. And um, you know, we speak from experience at this point because our HIV functional cure has now been approved for a phase one human trial. Now, let me tell you something else about human trials. Um, the thing about gene and cell therapy is because of the power, it also comes with danger. Because of the danger, the FDA only allows you to use it on uh, acute needs. Uh, now, there are a lot of acute needs that can be addressed with gene and cell therapy because of the power that we have to really go in there and completely rewrite DNA code to undercut the drivers of disease or to make changes that can very powerfully mitigate disease. So frequently when we do a gene or cell therapy, we're talking about a cure to something that is incurable. So many things reach that acute level at the FDA. Now, because they see this as you know, new and risky as a result of being new and because the changes that we make to people are, are frequently permanent. When we give a drug, it doesn't wear off. We're actually reprogramming cells that will have that programming for the rest of their existence. And by programming, I mean we're, you know, your DNA is these four symbols, ACTG, the four nucleotides that the order of those uh, make up your genes and those genes determine everything that goes on in the cell. Well, ACTG sounds a lot like zero and one, right? That's what your computer, desktop computer works in all zeros and ones. Your body works in four symbols, base four, but it's similar in that way. So when we put new code in there, that code could persist, persist for the rest of your life or at least for the life of that cell. So the other thing that the FDA requires is that you prove enough safety before you go into any humans. And when you do your phase one human trial, you do it on sick patients. So that means that you're not just gonna get safety data in a phase one. Remember in a traditional drug, you're gonna build a whole pill factory to treat 15 college students who are healthy to see at what dose do they get sick, right? All you're doing is a safety study to make sure that you can find a safe dose for the next thing, which is your efficacy study. Well, in gene and cell therapy, that's compressed. Your phase one will have safety, of course, but because you're dealing with sick patients, you're, gonna, you're likely to get some efficacy signal. And it's quite common that gene and cell therapy gets approved in a pivotal phase two. So the whole time we're looking at is maybe a maximum of four years from bench to a, uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, approval. It might be a in-market phase three or something like that but uh, there might be a limited license that could come out of a phase two. Uh, frequently, gene and cell therapy is applied to monogenic diseases or rare diseases, which again, give you some advantage in this regulatory process. So, uh, the other thing that you get is a lot less patients. That also reduces the cost, you could imagine, in the trials. And then finally, what you're getting is because of the deterministic nature of gene and cell therapy because uh, we are literally taking viral particles and putting new things inside of them. And these capsules will go 
in a very uh, well understood way around your body. Well, what does that mean? The phenyl, uh, the uh, pharma distribution is pretty well established the first time you use a particular virus in somebody's body. So if we do experiments with lentivirus, well, guess what that means? Uh, that data applies to every other lentivirus um, IND that gets submitted to the FDA. And, and what does that mean? Well, they're getting smarter about this. They understand that various components that are part of treating in gene and cell therapy have very deterministic or determinable uh, behavior in the body. And so everything that we do, every experiment we do applies to every experiment that anybody else does in gene and cell therapy that applies to every other experiment. Frequently, the only thing that's changing is not the, the, the carrier. Somebody's using lentivirus or AAV. Okay, there's lots of people experimenting with those two carriers. And then what it applies to is the gene that's inside. How will that gene be different than other things that have been put into the body before? And so you can see that the FDA can generate sort of a heat map. Where are the risks? Are the risks in the lentivirus? No, you can see this is sort of in a green area here, is the risk in a cell process. If we're pulling out uh, uh, a certain type of um, cell from the body, like an immune cell, and then modifying it ex vivo and putting it back in, um, you know, the cell process can become understood. And one of the things that we leveraged is uh, CAR T's had done thousands and thousands of patients uh, taking out T cells and modifying them ex vivo and putting them back in. And as a matter of fact, the FDA looked at our product for curing HIV and they said, we didn't have to do tox studies because we were basically doing the same thing, pulling out T cells, modifying them ex vivo and putting them back in. And our modification was less toxic and the number of cells was less than a CAR-T, and so they saw that as being inside the safety envelope of a CAR-T, and they didn't need it reproved that there would be a problem, you know, that there was no problem with toxicity. Look, this is coming on strong, and because it is inexpensive and it is more deterministic and it's getting more and more understood every day, the number of drugs that are being developed in this area is climbing substantially. Because they're being reduced, they're able to be created at a lower cost, this is going to be a competitive industry as well. So there's a lot of benefits in the regulatory uh, burden coming down because of the deterministic nature of this, but there's also a lot of benefits in terms of the uh, bringing uh, down the, or bringing up the competition and it leading to better and better drugs. I'd be remiss to not remind you that we have been approved for a IND, uh, for a phase one human trial of our uh, HIV functional cure. So I hope you'll look at our website and check that out. And if you have any questions or would like to get in touch with me, there's a contact form on our website and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I don't see any questions in here and I think we are out of time. Unfortunately, I don't have good access to a clock. Um, but let's see here if I can get a message from. Hey Jeff. Yeah, it's right at one thirty-five. Okay. You're, good. you're perfect. Well, then I will, uh, just say thank you very much for everybody attending and, um, I'm around the show. So I hope I'll see you at the booth. Take care.